a very warm welcome here uh, from my side as well. Uh, joining the digitalization session means that you're going to continue with me as a, in the moderation uh, until the end of the day. Uh, just to quickly remind my name, I'm Vinicius Valente, Communication Officer at the Joint Secretariat. And uh, so just uh, I just have a few um, housekeeping to do here before we give uh, the word to the actual speakers. Uh, just as a reminder to everybody, so uh, this is a networking session, right? It's going to be divided into two parts. Uh, in the beginning, I'm going to ask all participants to please, please keep your mic muted and the camera off as uh, we have an agenda uh, with the speakers already. And uh, I think it would be nice also if you could rename yourself uh, in the format that you can see on the screen. Uh, so surname, uh, name, and the organization. I think this is important. So of course, first we know uh, who is asking questions and the later it's gonna be very relevant for the networking part. So for the breakout rooms, uh, where we're gonna actually ask you to unmute yourself later and uh, uh, your camera as well. Uh, you'd be nice to know the, who is uh, talking uh, and where. Uh, during these sessions, you are very welcome again to ask questions to us uh, during the, the thematic sessions. So just before the planner, we're using Slido, but here you're gonna use the chat. So since you're connected on Zoom, you should have a chat function, as you can see on the screen, just next to the share button, uh, between the share and record buttons below your screen. Um, so yes, go ahead during the presentations, uh, ask your questions by text, and uh, we're gonna be collecting these to the speakers and gonna be asking these at the end of the session. Uh, and of course, if you encounter any technical difficulties or issues during this uh, thematic session, uh, we have two technical support people joining us as well. And they are named, so they're in the list of participants named as the technical support one and technical support two. So whatever issue you happen to have, uh, I hope you don't have any, but if you do, uh, just contact these people and we'll try our best to make sure that uh, you can follow this session with uh, no problems. Uh, I think that was it for housekeeping. Then the session agenda, as I said, this session is divided into two parts. We're gonna start first with the presentations. Uh, the first one is gonna be by our German contact point, Elisabeth, uh, who's gonna present how digitalization is currently addressed uh, in the current program. So the, the period between two, 2014 and 2020. Uh, then we're going to have uh, two project presentations from uh, two uh, projects we selected from the current period. The projects are uh, Be Good and uh, VR for Rehab, a very interesting project, so I do recommend you to stay with us. And uh, finally, uh, we're going to have a presentation by my colleague Alexandra on the more looking into the future, so how digitalization will be covered uh, uh, in the future program. Uh, I think that was it for housekeeping. No. Yes, that was it for housekeeping. So now I'd like to invite um, uh, our one of our German uh, contact points, uh, Elisabeth Woschkun, and I really hope my pronunciation is, uh, is uh, good enough here to share her presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, Elisabeth, uh, yes, will be sh uh, sent, sent, sharing with us some key figures and results for uh, Northwest Europe during 2014 and 2020. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, I'll... Yes, thank you, Vinicius. <laughs> Sorry about that, <laughs> my screen minimized. <laughs> yeah. So I will, I will start sharing my presentation to um, show you a bit more on how the topic has been addressed in the program from 2014 to 2022. And um, well, I have to start with the info that digitalization did not have a big focus in our program. Um, if you look at the program from 2014 to 2022, you don't find the word digital digitalization that many times, um, actually only once. <laughs> and, uh, but that's not a big problem or it didn't seem to have been a big problem as uh, the program did have a big focus on innovation and uh, to support the EU 2020 strategy on smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. And innovation was defined in quite a broad way. So it was something original, new and important in whatever field. And actually there digitalization found its way 
uh, to bring topics forward and it has been a cross-cutting element, a tool and an enabler for many projects. And um, this is why we have quite a broad variety of projects in the field, digital tools, and um, yeah, that benefits European citizens, businesses and the environment and therefore already um, yeah, um, contributing to the EU digital strategy that has these three fields as focus points as well. And we had a look on all our projects. Uh, we figured out that we can already group them in these categories. And um, this is what we have done. And I want to show you that um, slide. Um, sorry, I know we have a lot of uh, project partners in our audience today. And if I forgot any project and you say we should have been in there, then um, maybe you can discuss this in the sessions <laughs> and breakout rooms later on. Um, but I think it still gives a very good overview on what we have here, like projects making use of digital tools, demonstrating the opportunities um, for energy transition. So we have the environment part down there for social inclusion. We have a lot of projects on e-health, for example, like uh, VR for rehab, we're going to hear about later, IT for HSD. I'm going to show you some results of that project, Passion HF, looking at patients with heart failure um, and yeah, opening up new businesses or business models and opportunities. And uh, also for citizens, I put the ICE project here that focuses on needs so people, young people that have yeah, not too easy starting points for starting their, their professional career. And um, yeah, this is, this is what we have here. And um, yeah, as I said, also maybe Reemit might be quite interesting. It's a project that aims to increase, um, that uses big data to uh, monitor food quality and reduce food waste. So it's more on circular economy, for example. Also, we have industry 4.0 projects like machining 4.0, aiming to increase the knowledge and innovation level of SMEs in the machining sector to be in line with industry 4.0. So automation of traditional manufacturing industrial processes, for example. And um, this brings us to project results and achievements. As you can see, um, projects sometimes started a bit late. So it's also results that um, they're aiming for have only yeah, got uh, maybe only a few of them. And um, now, as I said, digitalization was not a specific topic in the program. So we cannot look at specific indicators. Um, but as I said, uh, we have many projects, actually 24 projects in the field of digitalization, digitalization making an impact in NWE. And um, as we are focusing on innovation and inclusive uh, topics today, um, I want to present you IT for NTST and BSTART and the projects that are presenting right after me are on these fields as well. Uh, so serving citizens and opening up new business opportunities. Um, IT for NTST is a managing anxiety via innovative technologies for better mental health. Um, they want to develop 10 innovation solutions um, serving patients with heart failure problems. They want to support 15 startups, create 45 jobs and training um, over 1,000 future mental health professionals. We have um, B-Start, blockchain-based applications for SME competitiveness. So they expect 12 SMEs to use one of their SME-specific blockchain solutions, create more than 20 new jobs and uh, a new turnover of 2 million euros in the sectors health, logistic and agri-food they're focusing on. I hope that has been a very good first overview for you to start discussions and to be excited for the um, projects that are presenting even further detail. And if you want to know about all the other projects, then I recommend to have a look at our impact brochure that has just been published a few weeks ago online uh, on the website of the program. And I am done with my presentation and Vinicius, stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I think specifically about the IT for Anxiety project, I think we're going to have, a, it's going to be the topic of one of the breakout sessions later. So if you're interested in that project, I would heavily, re highly recommend you to, to join that uh, breakout room. Uh, now from Elizabeth, we go, okay, here we go with my uh, pronunciation challenge. Uh, we have, uh, for next presentation, I'd like to invite Natalie Unk-Abrahams, and please tell me if the pronunciation is not good. 
who is from the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management uh, in the Netherlands, so Reit Waterstad. Uh, Natalie is a project manager for the Be Good project and uh, will be showcasing actual results uh, and uh, impact on the ground. Uh, over to you, Natalie. Hello, thank you, everybody, and uh, welcome. Um, um, your pronunciation was excellent, uh, Vinicius, and I hope I pronounced your name uh, correctly. Uh, Fantastic. We're both doing well. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we'd like to welcome everyone uh, uh, to our presentation. I have, like many of you, I'm sure, I'm faced with uh, challenges from working with home. So in a minute, I will just take the first slide and uh, my colleague Lika Bosma will take over from me thereafter to present the rest of the presentation. Together with Lika and my colleague uh, Raymond Foron, uh, who is away on leave, we lead the, the Be Good project. Um, we are very happy with the cooperation that we have. Data is indeed, like Elizabeth said, a major asset of the future knowledge economy. And the digital transition is the way forward and is present in every sector of, of our worlds. Uh, and uh, we are just grateful that Interreg Northwest Europe has been an enabler in the past programming periods. And we look forward to continuing on this path of cooperation with them and our valued partners to make a difference and an impact for future generations. Lika, I'm going to hand over to you. Good luck and thank you for taking uh, over from me. Thank you, Natalie, and uh, hello to everybody. I have to say that this morning, uh, uh, actually uh, uh, 10 minutes ago, there's some people starting some construction on the, on the, high, on the sideways uh, down the apartment. So I hope uh, it will be okay uh, for everybody to hear me. Um, yes, about uh, the Be Good uh, project. Uh, Be Good stands for uh, building an ecosystem to generate opportunities in open data. Um, and it's uh, aiming to unlock, reuse, and extract the value uh, from public sector information. Um, it facilitates an, an environment where uh, challenges, uh, yes, can, can experiment and uh, design solutions with uh, open data. Let me see if I can move to the next one, yes. Um, so yes, to see here the, the partners that we have in the, the project, there are uh, eight partners uh, ranging from, from local communities to uh, regional and uh, national authorities, and also uh, an academic uh, uh, institute. Uh, so yeah, we have uh, Rijkswaterstaat as the lead partner, uh, but we also have two uh, challenges in the, in the project. Uh, another Dutch partner is uh, the authority of Delfland. Uh, from Flanders, uh, we have the uh, Environment Agency. Um, we have uh, the Département de Loret and Orléans Metropole. Uh, and from uh, uh, the Glasgow City Council and uh, the Dublin City Council. And our um, academic partner is the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology. Um, so yes, a, a range of, of partners in all kinds of different uh, uh, sectors um, and yeah, different cultures. Uh, but yeah, it was a very strong uh, partnership and still continues uh, on. Um, yes, this uh, slide shows uh, the Be Good project in a nutshell. On the left side, you see in the green uh, column the, the the aims and the uh, uh, yeah the methodology of the project. Uh, the aim was to be a, a launching customer and to stimulate the use of the available data uh, to create jobs and to improve the public service deliver delivery in the field of infrastructure and uh, environment. Um, here in the center, uh, I will. it's a bit hard to read, but I'll get to that in the next slide. It will be bigger. Uh, th those are the, uh, the 11 uh, solutions that the pro project designed. Um, we had uh, five challenges in the application, but we ended up with 11 uh, challenges. So that's quite uh, an increase. Um, and in the, on the right side, you see uh, what the, the project, uh, what the impact of the project. Uh, so it was, uh, yeah, more than expected. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it was a very strong partnership and uh, yeah, very, very happy uh, with the, um, uh, cooperation. 
Um, then here are the, the Big Good challenges. There were 11. Um, and we encourage you also to go to the website of Big Good, where there is uh, each challenge uh, has a, a, yeah introduction and a, a video. It's also uh, uh, summarized in our booklet, which can be found on the output library of the of the website. Um, and the challenges they were really. Uh, diverse, uh, ranging from uh, for Rijkswaterstaat, uh, the predictive road maintenance uh, and the vital asset uh, uh, maintenance, uh, but also to um, yeah the, the wastewater uh, tracing uh, app, um, the uh, the check uh, check the that check the permit in uh, in Dublin, um, for example, uh, um, in the city center. Um, Lorry, lorries, uh, truck lorries uh, are not uh, really allowed until unless they have a permit. So citizens can check with the app uh, if if uh, if they see a truck a truck driving uh, uh, within the center if 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 this uh, is allowed. Uh, but also for um, uh, people on bikes in in Flanders, we had uh, the safest uh, the uh, the healthiest uh, air route. Uh, you could um, uh, in the app see uh, where you. You can bike and where there's less uh, pollution from uh, from traffic for example and it was all um, from the beginning uh, the aim of transnational uh, uptake um, uh, so people uh, the partners in the project they learned uh, from each other um, and uh, uh, they shared their challenges uh, but they also shared uh, how they used the data how they enriched it to make it suitable for the uh, uh, purposes in the in the challenges uh, and even also uh, they participated in each other's juries uh, for selecting the, the SMEs to develop um, uh, yeah the challenge um, then there's a short movie I hope it's working Reichswaterstaat is always looking for ways to make the maintenance of bridges, tunnels and locks more efficient. This means not too soon, because that's a waste of money. But certainly not too late either, because installations might break down. Predictable maintenance helps to schedule maintenance at precisely the right time. So, how does it work? Consider this lock. It contains smart sensors that track all kinds of data, such as electricity consumption, engines turning on and off, and the movement of the lock gates. Is the lock using more electricity than usual? Then we will see if there is a logical explanation. Weather conditions, for example. We combine the data from the sensors with data from other sources about temperature, wind direction, water level and so on. And if this doesn't explain the high electricity consumption, then we investigate if additional maintenance or replacement of parts is necessary. Information from sensors is currently only available per location. That will change with predictable maintenance. Data is tracked and stored centrally. As a result, we can easily compare an installation at location A with similar installations at other locations. This way, we get a clear picture of the technical condition, and the supervisor then knows exactly what kind of maintenance is needed. Predictable maintenance offers many advantages for tunnels, bridges and locks. It extends the life of the installation and increases their reliability. This means fewer disruptions and less rerouting of traffic. It also prevents unnecessary maintenance and energy consumption, which will save costs in the long run. This way, Reichswaterstaat works efficiently to provide installations that are well equipped for the future. So yes, this is um, uh, a short video of one of the of the 11 challenges uh, the others also have videos like this and it shows in a nutshell uh, what the challenge is about and what the solution uh, could bring um, the way forward it's uh, yes we were luckily uh, approved in the uh, capitalization call 
Um, so um, we have an, an extension of the project till March next year, in which we use uh, six of the solutions uh, from the Be Good original project and uh, transfer them uh, yeah, to new geographical areas, uh, new target groups and new, uh, a new economic sector. So yeah, we have continued uh, the partnership um, and we also hope uh, uh, or yeah, kind of expect to also to continue the partnership after the project. Um, so it's been uh, 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 very good to, to work together. Uh, we started, of course, before the pandemic. So on the left, you see uh, uh, the whole partnership um, uh, at the beginning of the project, still together, uh, face to face. Um, uh, and yeah, it's it's also that uh, there was a, a high level of commitment um, um, in the within the organizations of all partners. So the steering group also uh, of the project also uh, yeah gave the mandate uh, to to all the partners uh, to perform in the project. Um, and yes, during the uh, on the right side you see a familiar um, side um, the the Corona. Yeah, it did have an impact, of course, um, uh, but because we had such a strong partnership from the beginning, um, uh, it was easy to shift to online meetings um, and to get familiar with all kinds of different um, platforms to, to, to organize this. Um, we learned quite some new skills uh, in that. Um, and yes, for the future, uh, we already are exploring with uh, with our partners um, uh, to continue the, the work in uh, in Be Good, um, but we'll also um, uh, maybe continue to discuss this in uh, in one of the networking uh, sessions that we have after this in this uh, session. So this is uh, from, from us. Uh, thank you uh, also, Venetius, for the opportunity uh, for us to uh, present the project. Um, and yeah, well, we're happy to take uh, your questions uh, afterwards, or if there's no more time, you can also contact mm -hmm. us directly. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, both to Lika and uh, Natalie. Uh, indeed, a reminder is that uh, both of them will be hosting a, a breakout room uh, after the presentations here. So if you do have more questions on the Be Good project, feel free to join this session and uh, address to them uh, directly. Of course, we still have a, a round of questions to all speakers of the, so the two, Elizabeth, Lika, Natalie, but also the next two speakers at the end of all these presentations. So again, please do not hesitate to ask your questions via the chat and we will try to, to take them. Of course, if you can also mention to whom you're addressing to, always uh, makes it easier. <laughs> uh, okay, next up on the agenda is, uh, I'll continue with my pronunciation challenge, is uh, Renko Hohendijk, um, who is in charge of the VR for Rehab project. Uh, Renko is an innovation manager at the St. Martin's Clinic in the Netherlands, and I actually had the pleasure to visit their premises just over two years ago before COVID-19 hits. And uh, so I had the, the opportunity to actually follow Renko's presentation on site. And uh, if you ever have the chance after this presentation to go there as well and visit their premises, I very much recommend it. Uh, so, Renko, we're interested to hear what you can tell us about uh, virtual reality-based uh, rehab rehabilitation tools. Uh, thank you for joining, and over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Vinicius. This was a great moment when you visited, and we had great fun. I'm going to share my screen and hope uh, that everyone can see uh, see what's uh, what's here well uh thank you again for the opportunity to present uh, the project vr for rehab which is of course a, a project focused on the impact of virtual reality in the in the physical rehabilitation and the, and the mental rehabilitation of our patients we believe that virtual reality technology can help people in their treatment because we can basically personalize the treatment we can measure it and, and uh, we can therefore be meaningful and impactful. Uh, we also were uh, awarded an extension uh, 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 recently in the capitalization call. So our, uh, our uh, network, which uh, or, uh, consists now of uh, parties in six different countries. So, um, and uh, as the, in the project before, our consortium is still growing. We looked specifically on, on a few topics. Can virtual reality help us with cognition, 
or therapy adherence in pain, maybe in upper or lower limb. And now lately uh, we are trying to look what uh, VR can do for COVID. Well, apart from, from every project that has a, a, a working package on, uh, on project management and on uh, publicity and on the long-term effects, we had a few very special uh, work packages in our project. One was the hackathons. We organized hackathons in order to generate ideas. Secondly, we organized game jams in order to bring those ideas to actually working prototypes. And the last work package were challenges uh, in order to build the, the prototypes into actual products that can be used in the rehab context. Um, and then, of course, we wanted to facilitate an, an open innovation network, and I'll tell you, I will tell you a little bit more about that. Well, first, the hackathons. Um, uh, the word hackathon is, is maybe not familiar with, uh, with everyone, so I'm going to explain. In a hackathon, basically, we try to hack the current system as, as much as we can. We, we didn't break into any computer, but it was, uh, it was basically large creativity sessions with a lot of people attending and a lot of people thinking, and what if we start from, from, from the beginning, what could virtual reality and augmented reality basically do to uh, improve uh, physical rehabilitation? And there were a lot of scientists, a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, researchers, doctors, patients in all these different countries. So this was quite, an, and clearly you can see this was before COVID kicked in, so we could really uh, be together and, and, and join and discuss. And this was already great fun in this, um, uh, in this part of the project. Uh, from every co country, we had a few winners and we brought them together in the next step of our project, which were called the Game Jams. And in the Game Jams, uh, uh, a few people, but they, the, the people are basically developing and testing prototypes. Uh, again, a lot of great discussions on how uh, technology, how sensor technology, how augmented and virtual reality technology uh, actually can con contribute to a good physical uh, and, and mental rehabilitation. And in the last uh, part, we, uh, we actually are implementing and testing and validating these concepts in the clinic with true patients. And uh, again, this is uh, another exciting part of the project with a lot of difficulties and a lot of technical hicc hiccups, but great fun to do. Uh, just like the previous project, we started with the idea to develop five uh, different uh, applications, five challenges, but we've done eight. So again, we, uh, we were so enthusiastic that we did a, did a few more, focusing on, on various aspects of the, um, uh, of the rehabilitation uh, process. Uh, some more on pain, some more on neuro rehabilitation, some more on upper limb stability or, or hand uh, function training. Um, but always in combination between a clinical setting uh, and some entrepreneurs and uh, again, great fun. And recently we did our sixth hackathon focused on COVID rehabilitation. We had 16 teams from all over Europe joining. Uh, and again, our uh, uh, next week, our development jam. So our, our next step will, uh, uh, will start. Um, um, and um, um, hopefully we can do this uh, in a live settings because uh, COVID is, uh, is uh, hopefully uh, on its uh, way back. Well, I'm a little bit stressed this week because um, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, we have a final conference of the first part of the VR for Rehab project. If you're willing to join, please let me know and I I'll, I'll can uh, give you some tickets to, to join this uh, this. Uh, this final conference, we have over 250 participants already. So you see uh, the impact of this project is, uh, is uh, enormous. And again, researchers, entrepreneurs, and, and scientists from all over Europe are basically joining uh, to discuss what the impact of the Afuria concept can, uh, can be. And we are kind of an open network. 
Well, I would like to share with you two videos to give you an impression of our uh, project. Um, the first one is about the hackathons. Okay, and I have another uh, uh, video for you, and this is about one of the um, uh, the outcomes for of our project. We've uh, described our innovation process in a blueprint, which can be uh, found on our website pr4rehab.org, which can be downloaded, and we also have them in hard copy. So if you want to know about how what we did, uh, please please feel free to to get your copy uh, digital or uh, personal. But there's a short video about that as well. Hi, he is Koen and he is René. Okay, you have an innovative idea or an innovation and you don't know where to start. Well, the best advice we can give you is read the innovation blueprint. It gives you all the details, all actions, all steps you have to go over. It's about hackathons, it's about game jams, it's about stakeholder selection, it's about everything you need to know and everything you need to do for a successful implementation of your innovation in healthcare. Good luck. Do you want to use our learnings for your innovative process? Subscribe to the VR for Rehab website and we will provide you with a digital blueprint. Let's start innovating. Okay, and with this, I would like to uh, give back uh, the mic to uh, to you, Vincent. Thank you, Renko. Uh, very informative. Uh, again, if uh, you're interested in learning more about the VR for Rehab project, I really encourage you to participate in the conference as Renko presented, which is happening on Thursday this week, right, the 24th. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, if you can't, well, as I had the chance to go there myself and see some of these ER applications uh, on site, uh, I also recommend you to do that. Well, sorry, I'm inviting people to join your premises. Maybe you should do it, but I hope you don't mind. <laughs> I had a nice time. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks very much. We move forward with your agenda. With uh, we have a final presentation by my colleague, uh, and I should know how to pronounce your name now, Alexander, as we work for three years now, Alexander Colombani. Uh, who is the coordinator of the contact point network and communication units at the Joint Secretariat of the program. Uh, so Alexander will update you on the latest developments, uh, now more looking into the future of uh, Interreg Northwest Europe. So Alexander, thanks very much and over to you. Thanks, thanks Vinicius. Um, you pronounced my, my name perfectly well, you know it. Um, so yes, I will say a few words about uh, digitalization in the future program. Um, I have a few slides, so I'll share my screen also. But hello again to everyone, and I'm really happy to see uh, so much interest in this topic of digitalization, which has been at the core of so many of our projects in, in the current program. Also, 
very thrilled to see how um, people are picking up in the chat right now. It seems that the, the new program is already launched um, with, with all these people exchanging their contacts and um, uh, apparently having some ideas for the future program. So good to see. Um, as you heard in the panel discussion, the design of a future program is still in the making. The process has been launched more than a year now, and there's a lot that has been done already. Um, we have done territorial analysis of the Northwest Europe program. Uh, we've done a stakeholder consultation to, to which some of you have, might have participated. We have um, designed the, the new uh, NWE geographical area and some first uh, thematic orientations have already been agreed by our member states. But we are still at this stage at the heart of the process, especially on defining our priorities, specific objectives and type of actions. Um, and while some aspects are already quite clear, especially related to the green focus of our program as a whole, um, there's some other aspects related to innovation, to inclusiveness, which are still being discussed and on which we'll have uh, um, uh, a bit more clarity in the, in the weeks and, and months to come. Nevertheless, on digitalization, a few things can already be said. Um, as background information, um, it's important to remind that digitalization has uh, a big place in our EU regulation, the ERDF draft regulation, which is the basis for the design of uh, ETC and transnational programs. Uh, what it says is that um, ERDF, um, these funds should contribute to the development of an inclusive digital society. So from the start, inclusiveness is therefore seen as a major objective for digit digitalization and digital services, which already gives a strong orientation on the way this topic um, can be addressed. Three broad directions are mentioned, um, digitalization as a way to deliver public services more effectively, to enhance networks and services for local communities, and digitalization to address problems of disadvantaged areas. So keeping all of this in mind, um, how does that translate for the future NWE program? Um, the Northwest Europe program has already defined the uh, joint challenges that it wants to tackle um, through based, excuse me. Um, the, the, the joint cha challenges that it wants to tackle uh, uh, on the NWE area. And for most of these challenges, whether it's climate change, um, strengthening innovation capacity or tackling urban rural discontinuities among others, um, digitalization is seen as a way to, to address uh, these challenges. So considering the importance and variety of spheres of application that can be imagined for digitalization, our member states have decided not to select one specific objective, one specific SO, um, specifically focusing on this topic on digitalization, but on the opposite, on the opposite, the approach is rather to say that digitalization is a cross-cutting element to all priorities, a tool, an enabler, and not just a goal in itself. So obviously details on the cross-cutting nature of digitalization and all priorities will be explained in our Intreg program and in our program manual, which we are still working on and which will be pub which will be ready by hopefully the end of the year. But um, but be quite sure that uh, digitalization as a cross-cutting element will be very present uh, in in this uh, future program. So looking at the big priorities of our of uh, our program. In the, in the ones which have a green focus, priority one, two, and three, we can easily imagine that digital, digitalization can offer solutions to support uh, the development of uh, solutions in, in these areas, whether it's renewable energy sources or techniques, energy efficiency measures. Um, digitalization can also be used to offer solutions to engage consumers uh, in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And the same can apply also to circular economy mechanisms reduction of waste generation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've seen, by the way, in the chat that some um, organizations working on circular economy are already think of digitalization as a, a possible focus for one of their project, and they're indeed uh, fully right. Um, looking at the priorities four and five, which are still being currently discussed uh, and more focusing on innovation inclusiveness, we can also imagine of course, that digitalization will be playing a very big role in these uh, two priorities, especially as they will be very much focused on supporting uh, a balanced territorial development. So we, we can definitely imagine um, dig digitalization as a way to diffuse uh, innovation from, um, from urban to rural, 
uh, to 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 um, tackle the urban rural discontinuities in particular that I was mentioning. Um, and we can also imagine that uh, uh, facilitating the digital technology transfer between between uh, different regions uh, in the areas mentioned in priority five, in particular education, training, health and care services will also be a big focus uh, for the um, for, for the future program. Um, so moving on to the type of activities, this is not just focusing on digitalization. Um, these type of activities have already been defined as, as, as um, for, for all priorities and as uh, areas where we are expecting projects to, um, to, be, to be the most active. Um, so globally, I mean, in the type of activities that are considered, our program will be generally speaking, aiming at increasing stakeholder capacity to demonstrate, transfer, and implement um, new innovative integrated solutions. So to that extent, it can happen in the implementation of joint strategies or action plans. It can happen in demonstrating or testing of solutions. It can also happen through capacity building uh, and awareness raising activities. Um, so probably even more than in the current program, the future program will be looking for projects contributing to the diffusion and the adoption of solutions, maybe more than just focusing on pure technological development as we had sometimes in, in this program. And to that extent, citizens and communities will definitely be at the heart of uh, the program approach. Um, last bullet point, which is also important to really keep in mind, it was already the case in the current program, but will be even more in the future one, uh, the involvement of different stakeholders in projects through a quadruple helix approach. So public, um, public sector, private sector, universities and NGOs. So um, that's almost it for me. Just a last slide concerning the next steps. Um, we will have at the European Week of Regions and Cities, which is organized second week of October, another presentation on uh, our program. And hopefully by then we will be able to give you all the details on our priorities, specific objectives, type of actions um, that are expected. And we then aim to have our interreg program submitted to the commission by the end of the year, early 2022, to have a first call for proposals in spring 2022. Um, unfortunately, we are not in capacity to, to be more precise at this stage, but um, that's what we are aiming for. And of course, I invite you to follow all the latest news on our website, uh, where we have a future program uh, area in, on, that we update regularly and on which you will find all the, the latest uh, information. So that's it for me. Um, thank you. And I pass back the floor to Vinicius. Thanks very much, Alexandre. Uh, very informative. Indeed, I also build an invitation to please check the program website for all the up-to-date up information on the future. Um, we're a little bit short in time, but we would still like to take some questions to um, hopefully all speakers. Uh, so I invite uh, all speakers, so Alexandre, Elizabeth, Lika, Renko, and Natalie to just turn on your cameras and uh, we'll try to address you some questions if the time allows. I see that the chat is most focused on uh, presenting activities, which is great, but yeah, maybe I can start with a question to either Nat Natalie or Lika uh, on the main challenges for digital transformation in Northwest Europe. Uh, do you see maybe opportunities for, for transnational cooperation? Perhaps I could uh, respond to that. Uh, um, uh, there like we explained uh, in the presentation, transnational cooperation was one of the core threads in our uh, cooperation in the Be Good project. But what we did um, um, uh, face as a challenge was that although significant efforts were made between various partners uh, to adopt and uptake the innovative solution that was developed by one partner in another environment uh, from a second partner, language remains a slight barrier in the interreg uh, um, uh, project. So transnational cooperation uh, or uptake of uh, innovative solutions uh, meant that they would have to translate uh, uh, the language from French to Dutch, for example, or vice versa. And the cost, the price tag on that was just too high 
to be able to uh, uh, convert the data to another language, to be able to apply and replicate the solution. Uh, uh, so uh, a challenge in one way, but in another way, it was it, it worked in, with two partners, with uh, a Dutch and a Belgian partner. They were able, because of the language barrier was not a, a cause for concern there. Uh, they could easily replicate and uptake uh, uh, the uh, innovative solution that was done. I hope that answers your question. It does. Thanks very much, Natalie. Uh, yes, certainly language barriers uh, is a challenge. As you can see, I'm still working on my Dutch skills myself, but that still didn't stop us from cooperating the two of us. So thanks very much for that. Uh, maybe a quick question to Renko as well uh, on virtual reality. Um, so what would you say is needed to push the uptake of uh, virtual reality solutions uh, in the healthcare sector, maybe one step further? Maybe also taking into account uh, the COVID-19 patients in mind, is there anything you could tell us? Well, I think COVID-19 was a bit of a blessing in disguise for uh, digital healthcare, because uh, since we had to uh, uh, keep in distance from each other, um, uh, digital health or digitization uh, was a very efficient solution. And um, well, I believe that virtual reality technology can play an important role because the technology is available at affordable prices, is impactful and is measurable. And therefore, uh, um, I believe that, that for people who suffer from the effects of long-term, uh, long COVID uh, rehabilitation, this, this could be great, but it can also be an, an important solution uh, for um, for other uh, patient groups uh, as well, uh, we are an open consortium, and we already had some some uh, some participants from this call who are wanting to join. So so please feel free if you're in this field of, of uh, discovering new digital health uh, care solutions, join us, and uh, and maybe in the future program we can build a, a new project, mainly focusing on disseminating and on. Uh, uh, bring it into more uh, effect. Certainly. Thanks very much. There's definitely a lot of opportunities on that at uh, the moment. Okay. I think we're almost uh, everybody back. I hope you can see my screen well. And I also hope that you really had time to network and uh, take this time to exchange experiences, which is, yeah, one of the main goals that we had for, for these breakout rooms. Uh, again, if, if you didn't have the chance to exchange uh, contact numbers and you're still willing to do so, I really heavily invite you to do here on this chat. Uh, if you met somebody that, that you wanna keep contacts with, so go ahead and use the chat uh, to exchange your contacts here. Um, so yeah, unfortunately we are arriving close to the end now. Uh, we had two breakout rooms or a very intense morning and uh, really hope it was useful to you, all parts of the event. We really try to give you a good insight of how the future negotiations are going and also having some, uh, yeah, uh, well, good examples of presentations from our projects that uh, we're proud of. Um, before finishing, I just really would like to thank everybody for participating, to the speakers, to, well, participants as well, for uh, people who hosted the breakout rooms. It was really important to us. Um, if you are interested more in, uh, in finding out more about our projects, I really encourage you to check these uh, new publication we launched on April this year called uh, North uh, NWE Making an Impact Cooperation in Action, where you can really find in a nutshell a summary of uh, all the projects currently financed by the program. It's available on the program website. So yeah, I can say in a nutshell, but yeah, still a, do a long document of uh, uh, around 120 pages more or less, but it's a summary. So you can easily see one page per project there, um, what the project, the objectives of the project, uh, the achievements of the project have done and uh, what they're planning to push the results uh, one step further. Um, so please do check it out, it's very interesting. Then uh, as was said many times during throughout the, the morning on the plenary and the thematic sessions as well, all the information that we're giving to you today, uh, it's, um, it's ongoing. So the negotiations are still ongoing and they're really trying our best to keep uh, our website as updated as possible. So I really encourage you to check that as well on the website. This is really where you can find all the, well, the most up-to-date information. 
as these uh, change quite quickly. So we're having constant meetings with the member states and the program, uh, uh, the other program bodies. And really, this is a session where you can find uh, the most updated uh, information on the future program. Uh, and yeah, finally, just before finishing, you can also stay connected with us through website, through social media. We have accounts on um, Twitter, LinkedIn, and also YouTube channel where we try to put all the videos from um, uh, not only from the program, but also from the project. So do check these out. And uh, with no further ado, I thank everybody for participating uh, in the event today. I hope you're useful and I wish you all a very nice day and a very nice summer as well. Stay tuned. <laughs>